to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is From Insurance Sales to $8 Billion RIA, a Northwestern Mutual Breakaway Story. It's a conversation with Andy Schwartz, principal of Bleakley Financial Group. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. For Apple Podcast users, I'd be really grateful if you'd give the show a review. Your input helps us to make the series better and alerts other advisors like you who may find the content to be relevant. And while you're at it, if you know others who could benefit from the series, please feel free to share it widely. Admittedly, I love stories about people who build a business and ultimately themselves from scratch, so to speak. That is, starting from nothing and creating something bigger than they ever imagined. And this story is the perfect example of that. As Andy Schwartz, a principal at Bleakley Financial Group, tells it, it's not about where you go to college or where you grow up. Because Andy grew up in a lower middle class family in New Jersey who didn't have much, but worked hard for all that they did have. He served as a maitre d' at a restaurant to pay his rent and tuition to Glassboro State College. Then, in his senior year, started selling life insurance and was pretty successful at it. And that's when he knew he was on to something. Andy went on to become the top advisor at Northwestern Mutual with $3.5 billion in AUM and the leader of one of the largest groups at the firm. After nearly three decades, he and the team left Northwestern in 2014 to go fully independent as Bleakley Financial Group. Today, Bleakley has about $8 billion in assets under management, and Andy, a $10 million-plus revenue producer, has been recognized by Forbes, Barron's, and the Financial Times as one of the industry's top advisors. In this episode, he shares his incredible story with Lewis Diamond. It's a narrative that exemplifies how hard work and determination can lead to good fortune. He digs deep into the limitations of working for an insurance-focused broker-dealer and how those limitations motivate the team to leave the firm. Then he talks about the explosive growth of Bleakley since forming a hybrid RIA with LPL, Schwab, Fidelity, Pershing, plus the role of alignment, capacity, and scale when recruiting advisors. It's a unique spin on business growth that has relevant takeaways for every advisor. So let's get to it. Andy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Excellent. So let's get to it. Can you just briefly tell us about yourself? How did you get started in this business? And from our prior conversations, it sounded like you were really a self-made guy. So curious to hear how you ended up right where you are today. Sure. And I think whenever I tell our story or my story, I hope it gives people confidence um, that they're, they can accomplish anything they want to in this business. I grew up in Willingboro, New Jersey, pretty lower middle class, um, went to John F. Kennedy High School went to Glassboro State College, and I went to Glassboro State College for two very specific reasons. We didn't have any money, and I had low SAT scores. So it's not about where you go to college, and it's not necessarily about, you know, where you grow up. And it's a blessing for me, and I think about this every day because we are so blessed with everything that this business has given us, that I grew up with not very much, and now I have so much. And and sometimes I think and feel sorry for people that grew up with a lot because they just have no idea how fortunate they are. And we certainly do because, you know, uh, my twin brother, Scott's my partner. We've been partners since we were five years old uh, as far as working. So that's a little bit of background. And then my coming into the business, like probably most of the people listening today was by complete accident. I was working my junior year in college at a restaurant. 
I had a bit of a falling out with the guy that owned it. And I was making pretty good money. He was paying me like 500 bucks a week. I was a major D. And that's sort of how I paid for school and I paid my rent. And he didn't need me for three months. It gets slow until the holidays. So I, at the same time, ironically, my first wife was living in a house, running a room from a, an, an insurance general agent with Fidelity in your life. And Fidelity in your life sold life insurance to college seniors if you can imagine. So I went home and I basically lived there as well. And Steve said, well, why don't you just sell life insurance your senior year? You know every senior on campus. So I remember sitting on the beach in uh, Ocean City, New Jersey, studying for my insurance exam right before my senior year in college. And what happened was I, I started to sell policies and I, I found myself making like four or $5,000 a month selling life insurance policies basically on notes to college seniors. So I knew there was something going on. And then fast forwarded in the spring, my brother Scott, who's my twin, has a job interview in Fairfield, New Jersey, which really was the genesis of the Bleakley Financial Group. And he calls me from a payphone in the turnpike yelling how rich we're going to be. I really come up to Northern Jersey, not because I had any interest in joining the firm, but since I was such a an experienced uh, financial professional, you know, selling life insurance for six months in college. I just kind of went up <laughs> to see what was going on. And, you know, we were really impressed, not so much with what they were doing at the time, but what their vision was. And like the way things are, I guess the expression, you know, we end up going to Northern Jersey and that was the beginning of this thing. And it's just been a great run. So I've actually been associated with the same firm for 36 years now, you know, my first job out of college. That's amazing. So Bleakley was a firm that was already in existence when you, when, when you joined it. Yes, it was Princeton, Burton, Bleakley, and Dwyer. So none of the original principals are still here. Gary Bleakley left the firm a number of years ago, but we kept the name because it was the first you know, name of the firm and it was kind of our recognition. And then when we went independent, we just decided let's make it simple. So Bleakley Financial Group was just nice and simple. Very but, yeah, good. That was, yeah. Back before it was popular, you figured out that there was a market for helping clients with not just insurance, but also with investments and planning. Can you talk about the evolution from selling life insurance to moving more into the holistic wealth and financial planning market as well? Sure. And really important decision uh, that we made. I got my CFP my second year in the business. And there weren't a lot of people getting CFPs. And at the time, I did it more just to differentiate myself in the marketplace because we were still primarily just insurance agents at the time. But a couple of years in, I realized that there was a very good opportunity to make a very good living, you know, selling life insurance. And I figured I could probably make a million dollars a year someday. But I had a couple of different thoughts. And there were three things that motivated me and for me to convince my partners to kind of go along with, I guess, the grand plan. And that was one that I always kind of felt like he who or she who controls the money, you know, controls the client. Oftentimes, I would ask a client to buy insurance and you would get the answer. And this is the answer that always makes an insurance agent cringe is, well, let me run it by my financial advisor. And, I, and the first thought was, I want to be the financial advisor. I don't want someone else to be involved. The second was that the hard part about our business is client building. And that's whether you're an insurance agent or you're a stockbroker or a financial advisor, it's the client building. It's going out and finding the clients. So if we do the hard work, it just makes sense to me like in any business, why wouldn't we leverage those relationships? So not only do I make money selling insurance, but I did health insurance, I sold disability insurance, I wanted to do the pension plans, I wanted to do the investment work so that every client it didn't just represent a commission and maybe a small renewal every you know couple of years, but they represented this you know revenue flow, and then I could really spend more time, provide more service, you know, have a much deeper relationship with them, and I also saw a way that you know we could really have an expansive revenue uh, flow in the future. And then the last part was I just could not imagine selling something, whether it were insurance or anything else, to make a living you know, for my whole life. I didn't want to be out there when I'm 60, which I'm a year away from, hustling products in order to make a living. I mean, and I, I think back now, and I am so grateful to the 25-year-old me for making that decision because I cringe thinking that if I were still just basically selling things and relying on whatever that outcome was year to year, this late in my career, that would be very sad. 
And instead, I have the opposite. You know, we have these massive revenue flows that we know coming into the year, we know exactly what the revenue is going to be. And then we can plan our lives and we can plan our businesses and we can plan the money that we want to spend in growing our businesses, you know, based on that. Yeah. And on the insurance side, at least initially, and for a while, you were affiliated with Northwestern Mutual, which enables an advisor to both be on the insurance side, but also offer planning and investments. And I believe at your peak with Northwestern, the group was around $3 billion in investment assets, and you were the largest investment focus group within Northwestern Mutual. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship with Northwestern and what was also the inflection point in, in your relationship with Northwestern, where you went from zero in assets under management and just sh- selling insurance to becoming a real powerhouse within the organization? Sure. No, great question. I mean, first, I was very fortunate because, again, everything in life, I believe, for the most part, is by accident. I don't know if a lot of people went to college to study insurance or even to study being an investment manager and advisor. I know today you could, but 36 years ago, you couldn't. So I was very fortunate that Northwestern Mutual just happened to be the institution that my brother Scott interviewed with, you know, uh, when we were still seniors in college. Great organization. And the greatest thing about Northwestern was the people involved in the company, and, and mostly, I mean, what we used to call agents at that time, but the advisors were just such a great quality of people, uh, client service oriented, planning oriented. So we got a great education, a great background. About six or seven years in, as we started to try to build out the business the way I explained before, which was sort of this business where we could service all of our clients' needs and really build a robust financial engine, we realized it was all about capacity. And so we started to invest in the business really early. I remember the first big employee that I convinced my partners, and I always had an advantage. I have four awesome partners today, and I've always had three or four partners throughout my career. And so what we always did was we always shared resources. And I remember the very first key hire that we did, again, almost you know, probably 30 years ago, was we needed to be smarter. You know, We needed to have capacity. And so we hired Joe Geslow, who was our planning expert, very, very smart, so we could actually go out into the marketplace with real financial plans so that we could attract money and we could attract larger insurance sales. And it was expensive. And something that I've been talking to advisors about for years and years and years, because I've got, I've done a hundred talks and we've done seminar work and Scott and I did Schwartz camps for the Northwestern field for more than a decade. But I always mention to any group I speak to that it's never about expenses. It's always about revenue. And if you can't spend money, if you can't grow capacity, you can't grow your business. And I was fortunate enough that because I had these three partners that we could sort of all chip in. So a $200,000 year employee didn't cost me 200, it cost me say 50. And we sort of worked on that premise for the entire duration. And what really bleakly now has become this $8 billion organization, which will become a $20 billion organization with the same premise. So instead of being four partners kind of chipping in to go out and buy resources and to create scale, now we have 40 advisors that we can basically all sort of use our scale and resources to now we've got, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of payroll. I mean, we've got an amazing leadership team, amazing resources. So that's always sort of been our thought. And so that was really the issue. And then the best thing that ever happened to me was I hired Paul Magistro about 21 years ago. Paul had a little bit more of a investment background than I did. So I was really selling mutual funds for about five years. And then Paul came in and he really had much more experience. And he was, that. that's really when the business just took off. And I would say two or three years after that, I started to lead Northwestern Mutual, you know, as an individual, the firm started to lead the company. And again, the business continued to grow from there. And when you're at Northwestern, were you technically independent? How did you think about that? Northwestern Mutual is run by what are called managing partners, or, you know, at that time was a general agent. And so, Everybody sort of had a different latitude. So my general agent for most of my career was a guy named Bob Stone, who was a wonderful man. And he always did his very, very best to sort of let us do what we wanted to do. You know, he respected our autonomy and that was always, you know, very helpful. And then Bob had retired about 15 years ago, so certainly long before we had left. What I find is the challenge, and not just Northwestern, because again, Northwestern's an awesome organization. The challenge, I think, for an advisor in any institution, whether it's an insurance 
you know, sort of based or a hybrid institution like a Northwestern or even an investment institution. It's an alignment issue and it doesn't make the organization or the institutions bad. It just means that we're not all necessarily aligned. So what's best for the growth of the Bleakley Financial Group, you know, what's best for my personal growth might not necessarily be what's best for the organization you represent. And then that's sort of where there's friction. That makes complete sense. We talk about the concept of congruence and a incongruence between firms and what an advisor believes. And we see it manifest itself in compensation plan changes if it's a wirehouse and trying to incentivize certain behaviors. And certainly exactly. in, the, in the insurance world, the incentives and probably how the firm invests were also misaligned with your vision for Bleakly. Exactly. That's exactly right. So a good segue here. You and your partners and your brother were obviously kings of Northwestern Mutual. You were absolutely crushing it as the largest group on the investment side with the firm, making tons and tons of money. You were, I'm sure, achieving your dream of making more than a million dollars a year. So life was pretty good. What was it that was frustrating you so much that you decided it was right to upset the apple cart and leave Northwestern? And I like to think of it not so much as what the frustrations were, but more what were the opportunities that we were missing. And it's really two things. It was really sort of, again, alignment and flexibility. And I'll give you one example. So shortly after we left Northwestern Mutual, we hired a chief investment officer, Peter Bookfar. And anyone in the financial world knows, I think, knows Peter Bookfar. You know, he's on CNBC probably four times a month. He writes everywhere. It's funny. I was on the phone yesterday with a client. He's a, an investment manager in the city and, you know, pretty big firm, three, four billion dollar hedge fund. And, you know, he was just saying because he reads a lot of Peter's stuff. And he, we started the conversation by, I just want to tell you how smart I think Peter Bookfar is. And the credibility that that creates is amazing, you know, with people that know. But the beauty of it was, is that we had the flexibility to bring Peter on and Peter could be the chief investment officer at any major institution in the country. He really could be. And I get lots of clients from large institutions that want him to come in and talk to their, you know, either their risk managers or their portfolio managers or just their macro, you know, economists. And we were able to bring Peter on because we have so, you know, again, this large asset pool, let him run a separately managed account sleeve for us. Obviously, there's fees charged, you know, for that separately managed account sleeve because he's a manager like any other manager. We were able to pay him through those, you know, through those fees, not necessarily really cost the firm anything, have this guy in my office every day and available to all of our advisors, but more importantly, available to all of our advisors' clients. So I spend in the wintertime, I'm in Florida one week and I'm in Jersey one week. So when I'm in Jersey, I'm in Peter's office three or four times a day. I get up in the morning, the first thing I read is Peter's morning commentary. He writes throughout the day if there's anything going on in the market, and that goes to all of our advisors. And then if I ever get a client who is scary smart and smarter than me, which plenty of them are, it's so nice. I just get Peter on the phone and I just, you know, I let him answer, you know, these questions. And it's such a, you know, what a confidence builder for me. And then the first really great victory that I got out of that was about a year in that Peter was with us. We picked up a $120 million institutional file, non-qualified, you know, and I had some large, you know, 401k pensions, but I kind of look at that as being different. This was actually just, you know, uh, asset management for a large, you know, for an institution. And I had had Peter Bookvar and, the, and my Steve Kuhn, my chief investment, he's, he really is our investment process guy, the guy that runs our think tanks. And I'm in this conference room, you know, with a lot of people, it's a really big conference, biggest conference table I've ever seen. And I'm at the end of this thing and I've got Steve on one side and Peter on the other. And a couple of the people on their committee were actually investment professionals. Some guy had spent a career at Fidelity, running fixed income or something very impressive. And there were some other people with really strong background and they all knew who he was. And so having him there and being available, you know, to them directly, you know, we won the business. It was very competitive. So when I go out into the marketplace with the capacity we've been able to build, I just have tremendous confidence. And so my average files now were probably two or three times larger you know, than they were, you know, just six years ago as they bring them on. And I've got, there's 15 examples of the things we've been able to do. So it isn't that where I was was bad because it was awesome. 
great organization, great people, and their advisors are crushing it. I mean, Northwestern Mutual is probably one of the largest, you know, I, I don't know whether you, the word would be third party or hybrid independent, but, you know, they're just amassing huge amounts of assets. We just had a different vision. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So if you can elaborate a little bit on what were some of the reasons or motivations then that led you to leave Northwestern? Because we talk about there needing to be pushes and pulls. So you talked about some of the opportunities and being able to bring on someone like Pete and bring the business more up market and compete for larger type opportunities. But how come you weren't able to do that within Northwestern? Well, I think when you're in an institution, and again, any institution, they have to sort of run that institution. And I don't want to say the lowest common denominator because I think that's kind of negative, but they have to run that institution at more of where the average person is. And if nothing else, it's just because of just capacity. You know, you can't have a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of different things. Uh, One, because you want to protect your institution against people making mistakes. And also, you just can't oversee it all. So I think what ends up happening is once you become an outlier, it becomes a difficult place to be. We just became an outlier. So we were asking to be able to do things that people in my marketplace could do, but it, it wasn't something that they had the resources or had the interest in doing. And so that was just part of the problem. And I think that a lot of people kind of run up against that, you know, sort of ceiling. And I also like just being at a conflict. And again, I think that they do a great job and, and they represent their clients well. But I always felt that there were some, you know, conflicts like at any institution. And I just wanted to be out of conflicts. I just want to represent my clients. I don't want to represent institutions. I don't want to have any bias. I just want to represent my clients. If they need insurance, great. If they don't need insurance, great. Whatever the assets are, we want to think that we bring them the best assets at the best price. And there shouldn't be any opinion from any other outside party influencing any of those decisions. But again, you know, we were able to build a great business there. And if we stayed there, we'd have a great business today. I just think that it's given us an opportunity to build a bigger business. And from a recruiting standpoint, it's given us tremendous flexibility because we have advisors that aren't interested in the insurance business at all. So there are no requirements on the insurance side. Some of them just want to be uh, advisory only. They don't even want to be broker dealer affiliated. That's perfectly fine. You know, we have several custodians. Some of our people are on a hybrid model with us. Some of them are advisory only. Again, we're agnostic. Whatever is the best approach, uh, the best setup platform for an advisor that wants to join the firm, whatever will make uh, him or her more successful, you know, we want to have that to be available to them and we don't care. It makes complete sense. And something we hear often from advisors that are practicing at a predominantly insurance focused broker dealer, like a Northwestern or a Mass Mutual or an AXA type firm, is that the investments the firm is making into the platform and the technology are more geared toward the insurance side rather than investments. Did you experience that when you're at Northwestern? Yeah. And what I would say is this, it doesn't even necessarily have to be that it's more focused on insurance and investments. So think about it. We have a dual mandate, right? We have a dual responsibility. So even if it's just as important to them, you're still siphoning off tremendous amount of resources, talent, you know, manpower, you know, woman power to other things that we just weren't that interested in. So if nothing else, it just makes it more difficult. And you can't get away from the idea that they are running an institution and you can't get away from the idea that premium drives these institutions and that doesn't make them bad. It's just a fact. And so you can't expect them to ignore that, you know, whether it's the way they compensate people or the way they recognize achievement or where pressure comes from, because they have to serve the policyholder who owns those companies the best they can. And obviously, the insurance engine is a very, very important engine in that process. And again, just not aligned. Yeah, just not, not, we just weren't aligned. It doesn't make them wrong. It just wasn't a good alignment for us. Because of that misalignment, you and your partners opted to leave Northwestern and affiliate with LPL Financial as your broker dealer and to become a hybrid RA platform that was multi custodial. When you went through your diligence process before joining LPL, what else did you look at? And when you were evaluating firms, what was your decision making criteria? We'd probably talk to 
I don't know, maybe 10 different institutions. And fortunately for us, because of our size, everybody was interested. And we had some really great conversations, learned a lot in our process. We had talked to Pershing, we talked to Schwab, we talked to Fidelity. One of the reasons that we went hybrid and we needed to be hybrid was because we had at that time about 25 advisors. And remember the way we sort of uh, grew up, if you start in the insurance channel, then typically just because of the time we, we entered the business, you had people that were in this call it brokerage business, right? Where they maybe had 529 trails or they had 401ks that were more annuity based or insurance based 401ks that were paying commission, or maybe they even were just getting trails on a non advisory platform. So we needed to have a platform that would allow those advisors to continue to collect that revenue. The firm at the time was probably at least 90% advisor that we had definitely made the decision early that we had very little interest or no interest in being in the commission business, but there are some assets that you even, you just had no choice. And so we wanted to have the flexibility, but to capture those revenues, not make uh, anyone have to make a choice if they walk away from $100,000 of reoccurring revenue. So LPL did have a pretty attractive, you know, hybrid model. You know, they, they seem to have uh, everything that we needed. But we don't really, again, they're our broker dealer, but we don't, LPL to us, they're a vendor for us. I probably have more assets on the Schwab platform today than I do at LPL. And I'm sure that will continue because that platform for the separately managed account business that we do works out better, cheaper, you know, for our clients. And again, we probably have five or six advisors that have no broker dealer affiliation. And, you know, and there's lots of reasons why you might or might not want to have broker dealer affiliation, but for those advisors, it works out better not to. And we love being able to go out to the marketplace and offer, well, the, one time we had five custodians, including LPL. Now we're down to four because of a merger, but it's nice to be able to offer flexibility. You know, maybe a client already has assets at some institution. They're comfortable with the technology they'd like to actually keep that Schwab account or that Fidelity account or that Pershing account, but they'd like to have a different advisor. We can just take those accounts over. We also like to be able to go to the institutions, particularly when it comes to borrowing, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, margins or lines of credit and to say, hey, you know, Schwab's at this level rate, what can you guys do? And, you know, we find that to be helpful as well. We just, the, the more optionality we can create for clients, the better job that we can do for clients. And, and I think clients want to see not just independence, but they want to see optionality. You know, they want to know that, that they're really getting to see the market. You know, they're getting to see what's available, you know, that someone doesn't just work for an institution. And that was a really good description or reasons for why multi-custodial is better for some. But even back when you transitioned, the business was smaller. And I say that somewhat jokingly because it was still a, a massive enterprise then at about $3 billion in assets. But you then had the scale to just form your own RIA and build it all on your own. What was the motivation to partnering with LPL and, and joining a um, in joining a multi-custodial platform versus doing everything completely on your own? Yeah, I mean, so, and, and there was really a third piece of that. Part of our LPL decision was we joined an OSJ in the middle. So PAG is our, what we call our OSJ. And I think it's really important that I, I bring this up because a lot of the conversations I have in the recruiting process, I'll talk to advisors that are at 200 million or 500 million, or maybe they're even at a billion and they seem to think that they want to create their own RAA, and I mean their own, you know, create their own ADV, hire the lawyers, do their own compliance. And to me, that is just such a mistake. And so what had happened was we realized that what we wanted to do was spend our time and energy focusing on growing our business, getting our business to where we wanted it to be, because we knew that where we were coming from, there were so many things that we weren't doing that we could do. And so we were really focused for the first three years of really building out this robust offering to our clients. And then uh, we started to focus about two years ago on the recruiting side. You know, we hired Vince to come in and run recruiting. And so we've been actively recruiting, you know, over the last couple of years. So I would say that the combination of the OSJ and LPL having the hybrid model, allowing us flexibility uh, to have a custodian, and they could provide all the services that we needed. The technology was good. It, it all just, it really did turn out to be you know, a great option for us. And it's worked out beautifully. That's a very interesting set of comments because that is the the big decision a lot of advisors grapple with, whether they're leaving um, an already independent broker dealer or an insurance backed firm, or they're at a wirehouse. It's kind of 
what is it that's most important to you? And for some, they want complete and unfettered autonomy. They want the highest possible payout. And they're okay with taking on extra work of having their own RIA because to them, that's the best use of their time. But many others, I think, fall into your category, which is sure, we have the this, this scale and the ability to do it on our own, but that's not really what we want to do. It's more important for us to focus on growing the business, focus on the right things. And even if it costs us some money and maybe we lose a little bit of flexibility, it's, a, it's an investment worth making because our time is our most valuable commodity. And, you know, Lewis, I would argue that they don't know what they don't know. So I would argue that it's not so much about that they want autonomy because I find that we have complete autonomy. You know, I don't ask permission. I mean, obviously, everybody has to be uh, compliant, but we're all governed by the same compliance, whether we're an independent RAA or whether we're, you know, uh, a hybrid. So what I would really remind or, or advise, you know, people to really think hard about is be very, very careful because this business has gotten very complicated and scale has become really, really important. And I think people make decisions oftentimes about making these changes. Sometimes it's about ego and sometimes it's about money. And I would say that both of those are probably bad reasons to make that decision. And when I say money, not to run a bigger business someday, a better business and obviously make more money because that's what, what it's all about. I mean, getting a check. But the, the ego part's really important because I'll talk to someone that's got a $500 million business and they have no idea what it is like to actually be fully responsible to run their own you know, independent RAA. And so what ends up happening is, and not only do they have no idea, but I would argue it's probably not their skill set because most successful advisors that I know, other than having vision and, and being smart and motivated and hardworking, you know, they tend to have great people skills great client skills, um, but not necessarily management skills or analytical skills, you know, because if they were, they're probably not great managers because I don't think that what makes someone a great advisor would necessarily correlates to being a great manager, you know, of an organization. And the business has changed. And I think what happens is depending on where they're coming from, if you're a $500 million advisor and you're in a insurance based institution, um, I guess we're anywhere. You're a pretty big advisor. But even for myself, I mean, I run about a billion and a half dollars. I wouldn't think about being my own independent RAA on my own. I wouldn't even think about it. And now we're at a point where $8 billion, we've got some decisions to make as a firm. We'll ultimately have to become our own RAA, independent RAA because it gets too complicated to explain to people. You know? And as we grow, you know, and that's something that is sort of on in the near future for us. And we've already had that conversation, obviously, with our OSJ. But I would just tell people to think really carefully because what you really want to do, if you're going to make a change, you should make a change because wherever you go, whether it's joining a firm like mine or going to another institution, that your capacity that you currently have is greatly increased. Because if your capacity is not greatly increased, then other than maybe somebody paying you a little bit more or maybe somebody writing you a big check, and I would argue all the money is fungible. It's all the same thing. All you're really doing if you take a big check is you're just basically selling your future. And I would argue that it's very sad to me when an advisor takes a really large check, and I get it, it can be very enticing. But if you take a really big check, then typically there's another side of that. And the other side of that is you're taking a lower payout. Well, if you join a firm like mine, our expectation is we'll double our business every six years or so. So if you can double a business and if you take a check, and if that check obligates you to be there for seven years or nine years, I just think that the math on that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a reason why they're writing those checks because one, they want to attract the advisor and two, they're making money on that business. And so what I always say to people is try not to make you know, long-term financial decisions based on short-term financial circumstances because it's a really big mistake. And my thought is join a firm if you do feel like you need to make a change that can enhance your capacity so that you can double your business. If you're not thinking that you're going to double your business twice as fast as you could where you are now, then I don't understand why anybody goes anywhere. But if that's what you're thinking, you know, then where can I go that will give me the capacity that I can double my business in half the time it would have taken me? And that if I can have a really strong payout, aren't I better off you know, than, than taking that check up front at a much lower payout? And then in five or six or seven years, you know, whenever that uh, period would have been up anyway, now my business is two or three times larger than it was. 
And not only that, but I'm part of such a larger organization that now my business isn't only worth whatever somebody's willing to write me a check for, but it's worth not only twice that because of my size, but the multiple on that is going to be a double, right? Because a $20 billion organization could sell at 20 times earnings or EBITDA, where a billion dollar organization, which is very impressive, you know, if you're a billion dollar advisor, congratulations, you've done a, an amazing job, but your EBITDA is, is, is probably half or less the EBITDA of a firm of the size that we plan to be or other firms that are there now. So I just think that people need to be thinking a little bit more long-term about these decisions. You know, the most valuable asset that we have is our practices and not just because it makes us money, but it is something, at least for the moment, that a lot of people are interested in and people are buying at, at very high multiples. So everybody should be thinking about how do they maximize that opportunity, both on an income basis over the next, you know, five, six, eight, ten years, and then on an ultimate exit. Lots to respond to there. Um, and I think the way you describe the thinking around taking a deal or a check makes a lot of sense. Ultimately, you had a crystal ball and you knew you would double your business every six years and you, you're able to then to, to reap the rewards of a higher payout, then everyone would do that. I think the counterpoint I would make to that thinking is you are still somewhat betting on yourself. If you're a wirehouse advisor or a team, taking a check from a firm, no matter who it is, even if it does reduce your, your payout, you are de-risking the transition. And if ultimately your business doesn't double, then at least you have uh, some nice money in the bank and you've been able to take care of your family. But I think it's those who are going independent these days that are willing to make an investment in themselves. They're willing to take the entrepreneurial risk. They're willing to defer the big payday until they monetize the business in the future. And their thought is, I'd rather keep more of my income and have more control rather than being saddled with W-2 income and giving all my growth really to my firm for a discount. To me, that would be kind of the, the distinction. But I, I th- think your, your comments are exactly right. And clearly, it paid off for you. Let's um, move a little bit just to the growth of Bleakly. So about $3 billion when you left Northwestern. Today, as we're recording this, um, it's an $8 billion organization. What do you credit with that growth? Yeah, I would say we have three words that we describe the firm. It's alignment, it's capacity, and it's scale. And so what's happened is because we sort of all work together, the firm operates, and I don't know if I should be proud of this or not, but the firm actually operates as a goal to break even. This year, we're actually running a little bit behind. So, you know, it's quite possible that to be an, uh, an equity owner obliquely means that you have the honor of maybe even writing a check at the end of the year to make sure that you know, we cover all the projects we want to bring on. But the idea is that we want to reinvest all the money that the firm makes into greater and greater capacity. And we have the luxury to do that because all the partners in the firm are advisors. So I'm not a manager. I'm not you know, uh, Mr. Schwartz, the partner. I'm Andy, the advisor. And so I do the same thing that all my advisors do every day. I know what their problems are because if there's a problem in this place, I have the same problem they do. And because all the partners have a large practice and a, a large P&L they run, we're not dependent at all on the revenue of the firm. And so the goal for the partners and the goal for all the advisors is aligned. We all want to be better. We want greater capacity. You know, I like to joke that I don't know two or three years from now, who or what we'll be hiring, you know, as far as additional services. I mean, you know, we've got our, our CIO, I've got a life coach on staff, you know, that actually talks to clients. Not, you know, everybody's involved in coaching today. I have a coach, everybody has a coach. Firms have coaches and she can talk to advisors. That's fine. A lot of advisors, what she does for us is she helps the teams because what I find is we have great advisors, but great advisors tend to have very dysfunctional teams. And that is definitely not productive. And so one of her responsibilities is to take a dysfunctional team and turn them into a happy, cohesive, well-run unit. And that's been a major change over the last, you know, three years, you know, organizationally. But what we also do is you offer those services to clients. We don't charge them. If clients are going through transitions, having difficulties, bad retirement, God forbid, a death, a divorce, you know, she is available and When you talk about the long-term goal of the firm, it's to create endearing relationships that are so sticky, you know, that these clients would never think about leaving the firm. 
you know, and it's not about rate of return. You know, it's not about our fees being 10 or 20 basis points higher or lower. And so the only way you can do that is to continue to provide services. So bringing on, you know, legal review services, bringing on accounting services. I like to joke with the team that, you know, listen, we'll walk their dog. We'll be their travel agent. We'll do whatever anybody wants done and whatever is being offered in the marketplace. The firm will make an investment to hire those people to do those services. And we can, and we can do it very cheaply because when you have 40 advisors at 8 billion, and you can kind of do the math and get an idea of what the revenue could look like. When I have 80 advisors, you know, at 15 billion or a hundred advisors at 20 billion, um, there'll be lots and lots of services that we'll be able to provide for clients that other firms will not be able to provide simply because they don't have the scale. And that's why I think that it's a mistake When an advisor thinks, oh, yeah, I'm going to be my own because I need complete autonomy, whatever that even means, I'm not even sure, because I don't want autonomy, I want help. You know, that's what I want. You know, I need help. So that's sort of the thought. And that's what we do. We, I have a wish list. You know, my brother Scott's always shaking his head at me and, you know, um, and, and telling me I'm crazy. But, you know, I have my wish list. And every year we seem to be able to check off a couple of those boxes. Um, and we're just going to continue to do that. big part of your growth plans, as you've alluded to, is recruiting advisors to leverage your platform. So what are a few brief reasons why an advisor would choose to join Bleakly or any platform for that reason versus just affiliating directly with a broker dealer and likely getting a little bit more money up front to, to join that firm? I think it's a couple of things. One is what we find is when we bring these advisors on, we're able to lower their costs, you know, to do business while they're actually able to raise, you know, their fees or become more profitable. You know, so, and we have found that on every, and I'll say an acquisition or every onboarding that they come in and the internal cost to run their business goes down. So, but their profitability goes up. So it's costs their clients less and they make more. So that's been great, but it's, it's capacity. So when they come on, if they haven't been able to build out the capacity on say the investment offering side for a relatively small amount of money, we do all the work for them. You know, we have what we call our think tanks. So there's a dozen investment professionals here that put together the portfolios, do the investment reviews, do the takeover proposals. You know, they do all the work. Um, because what I want my advisors doing is going out and identifying prospects, onboarding new clients, servicing their ex- existing business. You know, I like to say that my job is to read the news. My job is not to build everything. One, I'm not that smart. And two, I don't have the time to do it, right? Because you you got to pick one or the other. And the problem with the business everywhere and something that we've been trying to address for, you know, for decades and something I really worked hard on at Northwestern institutionally to try to help them was that you can't have 10,000 one person armies running around, right? And everybody having to, to build this capacity themselves. The problem is it's hard for people to come together that everybody's is sort of on the same page. And so when they come here, all that capacity is created for them, you know, so that for a fraction of what it would cost to have the services available, a very, very um, successful advisor isn't necessarily going to have a life coach, you know, on their staff. They're not going to have a nationally known CIO. Yeah, there'll be a CIO at the institutional level. And I could call my old institution CIO and say, hey, could we get on the phone with my clients? And they would say, well, how about like the second Thursday in May at nine o'clock? And I walk into Peter's office and I say, hey, Peter, could we, uh, I got somebody that's calling in in 15 minutes. I forgot to ask, would you mind coming down to my office, please? Unless there's something really unusual going on in 15 minutes, Peter is out of my office. I hit it on speaker. And so it's really about that capacity. And then again, there's two ways to look at this idea of more money up front or more money, you know, down the road. But I've always bet on myself. And I just think that to be able to get a big payout and to, and if you can have capacity to really grow your business, that to me should be the fundamental reasons why somebody would make a change, not to get a little bit more money up front. That just never made any sense to me. Absolutely. That's great comments. And it's you're investing in the capacity is what is really the decision you're making. It's all about capacity. Look, I like to say to people that I want to go out into the marketplace. I, first of all, I want to be as good or better than anyone in my market. I never want to feel like I'm second 
tier or that I'm a B player in a market because I just don't have the capacity. So I would go into the market with overwhelming force and overwhelming force is capacity. That if a client says, I would like to do this, can you do this? The answer is yes. And if I can't do it, and somebody else can do it. We're going to buy it. We're going to hire it. We're going to make that happen because we have the scale to do it. And so whatever decision an advisor makes, if they make a lateral decision, like, you know, I can talk to the, the advisors that we talk to and yeah, I can tell them that they're going to make a hundred grand more by joining us because they don't have these program fees. And there's certain things that, you know, it's just cheaper to do business with us. And, and so they'll make more money, but I tell them, don't do it for that reason. Don't make a change. Don't disrupt your life to make an extra hundred grand a year. It doesn't make any sense to me. Do it because with the capacity that you will will add to your practice, you'll be able to double your business in half the time. If you don't believe that, don't do it. If you believe that, then do it. But that's the reason you do it. You know, not not to make an extra hundred grand a year. That doesn't, to me, it's not worth that, you know, after tax to disrupt your entire world. Well said. So the question I've been thinking this entire time is you yourself are still a full-time advisor and you're running, you said, a billion and a half in assets um, just in your personal practice, but also you're the, the visionary and you're the, the head of Bleakly. So how do you find time? How do you allocate your time between those two competing roles? We've had John Cutton on the podcast before who made the decision to take off the advisor hat completely and just become a CEO. And many advisors, whether they're employees now or they're running their own RIA, sometimes struggle with the decision to either focus everything on the advisor side, focus it all on, on being a CEO. It's somewhat rare, actually, to find someone who's, who's a jack of all trades like you. Well, I would say a couple of things. First, I have four uh, terrific partners. This isn't really just about me. My brother likes to make fun of me all the time. So he calls me the face of the firm, you know, and then he likes to send funny pictures with that. But so I would say that one, you know, we, I do have four partners that are very, very involved, obviously, in helping run this firm. But we have a great leadership team. We have a big leadership team. We trust them. We give them a lot of responsibility so that we try to meet every Monday afternoon for at least an hour. And then every other Monday, we have, you know, a two-hour partners meeting where we go over all the issues and everybody reports on their own departments. I think that the beauty of our firm and, and what the real difference is, it is the alignment. Because when you think about the fact that this is a little bit unusual. What ends up happening is a very successful advisor becomes the CEO of his, of his or her business. They're able to leverage what they built and they're probably much, much smarter organizationally than I am. And then what they become then is they become someone running this organization and then they start focusing on different things. They focus on EBITDA of the organization. You know, they focus on you know, growth and, and maybe even a transaction. As an advisor, which is really the way I earn my money. So as an advisor, I'm completely aligned with every advisor in the firm. And so we have perfect alignment. And I just think that for us, it works. I'm not saying it's the smartest way to do it. There are times where I do feel like I wish I had a few extra hours in a day. Being 59 years old and having grown children, you know, so that it's no big deal. I don't have to be at a soccer game at three in the afternoon or at a parent conference, you know, a teacher parent conference, uh, you know, at two o'clock. Certainly 20 years ago, this would have been impossible for me. But, you know, I do have time. So, you know, weeks are busy, but I do take some time off. You know, I, I typically don't work on a Friday, always engaged in the process, certainly not taking client, you know, calls on Friday. But I think that the advantage for me is that it keeps me engaged in the process that's most important for the firm, and that is serving our clients. And if I'm not, you know, in the trenches with clients, I think that it would be very easy to sort of lose touch with that. And I talk to executives all the time and people that run firms, and they they talk to you and they, they have this idea about what people want or what's important. And I just sometimes find that they're so removed, you know, from what we're actually doing day to day. And I really, I don't want to go there. You know, I'm going to stay engaged. I brought on three, I guess, advisors onto my team. And my goal is to try to get my book down to 100 files. I mean, I'm I'm woefully short of my goal up to now, but I'm working on it. And that's something I work on my coach every month. We talk about where's the book, where are the numbers, you know, because I'm still growing the book. So I've got to continue to, to downsize my headcount because it just becomes impossible. But yeah, but my goal would be to continue this, call it hybrid position for as long as I can do that. 
Love it. The old player coach. Exactly. I did the same. So what's next for Bleakly? And how have you begun to think about your own succession plan? You mentioned yeah. you're 59. Um, you clearly have a lot of passion and energy for the business, but Andy's not going to be the CEO and advisor forever. So what's what's your plan there? The goal for us is to bring on at least a billion dollars a year in new advisor assets to make sure that all the existing advisors are growing their books. I would say at least, you know, uh, a 10%, you know, kind of growth rate so that everybody's onboarding, you know, bringing on clients, we track net new assets. The goal is definitely not to, to, for an advisor to, you know, grow with their book as much as they lose their book, because we all know that money comes in and money goes out, but that they have to grow their books net because otherwise, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. And it's important for them. We made a commitment to all these people to join us, be with us, because it's going to be good for you. If they don't grow their books and that wouldn't have been true. So that's a big focus for us. What we want to do is get to a certain size first that we're big enough that we can offer and provide maximum capacity. We can compete at any level. But also, I want to create optionality for all of us. And I think what that means is that I don't know how long the business will be as attractive from a a purchasing standpoint. You know, will will institutions and other people be willing to buy these businesses for the multiples that we're seeing today for a, another year? Will it be 10 years? Will it be 20 years? You know, hard to know. I mean, interest rates certainly have something to do with all of the transactions that occur in, in every industry. What I want is I want to give everybody in the firm, all of my partners, because really all 40 of us are, are basically partners the way we operate. I want all the partners to have the optionality to say, you know what, I'd like to sell half my book at this really high multiple, or I'd like to sell all my book at this really high multiple. My feeling for me personally is I will be engaged with the firm and with clients probably for a long, long time, but it will be probably at a, a different level as far as um, how many clients I work with. And I'm guessing that there would be some kind of a transaction, you know, sometime in the future would be my best guess. Perfect. Thank you for your transparency around that. Last question, and then we'll, we'll send you on your way, is just something we ask every guest is, do you have any advice for advisors contemplating a transition at all? but especially a transition into the independent wealth management world? Yeah, I mean, well, first I would say that don't be afraid. Change is hard. And so I think the first very rational fear that anyone that's contemplating making that kind of change, and if they weren't thinking this, they would, you know, I would say they're crazy at least to not be thinking about it. But I think what they all, what most people think is, will my clients come with me? And the answer is, if you're a good advisor, then the answer is yes. We've seen... 96, you know, percent, 97% of the clients come over. I mean, we had a client, uh, we had an advisor on board with us last, if you could imagine, like the third week or fourth week in February was his sort of onboarding date. So he onboards right before, you know, the pandemic. And, you know, his book is probably 30% greater than it was, you know, when he left. So that's the first thing. Don't be afraid. If you're a good advisor, then your clients will 100% come with you. The second thing, and we spoke about this a little bit before, be very thoughtful about the decision. Think long-term, don't think short-term. And again, I, I always like to say, you know, don't make long-term decisions based on short-term financial difficulty because what you're building is very valuable and you don't want to just give that away. And, and again, everybody's circumstances are different. I'm obviously entrepreneurial. I've always bet on myself. And other people, you know, might have a different, you know, outlook. Um, and it, it'll depend on how old you are and lots of different factors. But I would say, and wherever you go, whether it's to get a bigger payout or because you want more flexibility. And a lot of times, sometimes people leave because there was an issue. There was a problem. You know, they just, they couldn't take it anymore. And just make sure that wherever you go, that they will make you better. Make sure that your capacity will grow. Don't just go because you can make an extra hundred grand. Go because you know, that you will be able to be a better advisor immediately, that you can plug into some environment, you know, that will make you better than you were. And those are the things that I would think about. And don't let ego get in the way. Because whenever I'm talking to some young, you know, advisor, and they're talking about autonomy, and, and again, and that comes up all the time, because they don't say to you, 
I wanted to be Andy Schwartz and Associates because I'm egotistical and I want everyone to know that, you know, I'm the boss. They say, I just need maximum autonomy. And I'm talking to some 35 or 40 year old. And what I want to say is you don't even know what you don't know because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was 55 years old or 53 years old. And I had no idea what I didn't know when we made our transition. So just be really mindful. Don't make it about ego and make sure that when you're done, when you turn that switch, because your clients will come with you, just make sure that you have capacity to be a better advisor after you made that move than you were before you made that move. Sage advice, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing a little bit about your journey and how you think about creating capacity for advisors and just your thoughts on the industry. No, my pleasure. Thanks for letting me, uh, you know, uh, be part of your podcast. Yeah, we're big fans. Fantastic. And shared a lot of great advice. But one bit that really resonates is this. Being thoughtful in your decisions and focusing on the long term are key to guiding success. And ultimately, if you're a good advisor with solid relationships with your clients, you have nothing to be afraid of. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration may require. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached by cell at 973-476-8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, I'd be grateful if you gave it a star rating and a review. That will let other advisors know if it's a show worth their time to listen to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.